Now we'll turn to um, questions from the um, from the subcommittee uh, senators, and you know, Senator uh, Marshall and I we we're part of a long tradition of partnering between Massachusetts and Kansas, uh, going back to uh, Dr. James Naismith inventing basketball at Springfield College. And then um, the University of Kansas stealing him away for the, to be and his their, rules. Their, their, and, and, his and his rules to be the first basketball coach at University of Kansas. So, so this partnership has a long, rich history uh, in medicine and in basketball. Um, and, um, and we're good at inventing things, but uh, the application out at the University of Kansas has been much better than any Massachusetts college in the basketball field. And we're hoping here that this partnership that we're creating can help us to get the correct formula. Uh, the correct rules, like the Naismith basketball rules for AI. So let me go to you, Ms. Uh, Huberty. In your testimony, you included a powerful story of AI directing care for a patient by deciding what is covered by insurance and that there are many more people who are currently uh, experiencing this who don't know to challenge these decisions that are being made by AI about their health care. Ms. Huberty, uh, what do stories like Jim's that you retold us here. Uh, tell us about insurance companies and companies developing artificial intelligence and how they're incorporating patient experience versus their profit motivation. Can you talk about the lesson we should learn from that experience? Sure. I do want to focus first just on the fact that this is not new technology That's that we're talking about in Jim's case. It's been around since I've started as an attorney. I believe it was used beforehand. So a lot of times when we're talking about chat GPT, that is, that is new innovations. We're just starting to get a sense of how it's affecting us. But the technology that affected Jim and has affected hundreds of residents in Wisconsin is not anything new. So we have a long history of showing that this algorithm, this use of predictive technology, has shown time and time again that it's incorrect. They come to us and our agency, we appeal, we get it overturned. And so we see that, that so often that number, that computer, that algorithm gets it wrong and there wasn't enough human oversight. Yeah, and um, who should bear the burden of proving that the use of artificial intelligence won't harm patients. Where should that burden of proof lie? Right now, I think that should be with those subcontractors that have developed and are using that AI. Yeah, and, and I do agree with you, by the way, in terms of this being an old technology. Mm -hmm. When Al Gore was vice president and I was the chairman of the telecommunications committee when we were breaking down all of the um, uh, monopolies in the mid-90s so we could have the digital revolution, the broadband revolution, not one home had broadband, and, February of 1996 in America, uh, I used to call these new technologies Al Gore rhythms, <laughs> right? So it's not a new word. Uh, it was obviously what the digital revolution was unfolding at that time, and, and we had to heed those, you know, those warnings that we were hearing at that point. Uh, Bonnie Castillo, who is executive director of the National Nurses United, the nation's largest union of registered nurses noted in recent written testimony for an AI insight forum on workforce that, quote, healthcare workers should not be displaced or de-skilled as this will inevitably come at the expense of both patients and of workers. And that's true, if not carefully implemented with government oversight and worker input. AI can harm healthcare workers by making them feel like the art and science of healthcare is distilled to typing into an iPad, and that's all there will be to it. Dr. Mandel, your testimony noted how technological advances can contribute to health provider burnout. Can you speak to the danger of using AI in the healthcare settings to automate both tasks and clinical decisions without government oversight and worker autonomy and input. The, the worker autonomy. Can you turn on your microphone, please? Autonomy and input is very important. And there has to be early on training and education of our workforce so that they can understand what the issues are and understand how to work alongside AI tools, what their functionalities and limitations are. There's a risk today of using an AI tool without understanding its limitations, for example. There are ergonomics and workflow integration issues that are key. Um, we heard uh, today that um, documentation burden 
uh, ballooned uh, with electronic health record uh, implementations. We have to design AI tools so that they improve the life and the, and the work life uh, of physicians while maintaining safety. Probably there's mental health support to provide to the workforce as well at a stressful moment when uh, there may be workforce shocks as a result of uh, AI um, and the shared responsibility uh, between physicians and AI, and we don't know where that's gonna equilibrate. Uh, there have to be legal and ethical um, safeguards um, to protect health workers um, from liabilities associated with AI. Um, we, it has to be clear uh, who is responsible uh, if the AI makes a decision that's uh, incorrect. Uh, that's gonna be, cause a lot of hesitancy um, and uh, anxiety otherwise. Um, we have to monitor, as I was talking, we, we have to have systems um, that are monitoring the output of AI and the, and the diagnoses that are made, the treatment recommendations that are made, um, the uh, claims denials that are made. Those can all be automated with data. We have the opportunity to move forward with, with um, getting the data flowing in the healthcare system so that we can monitor safety. And again, it's the same safety that we're talking about for um, devices, drugs, procedures, and, and AI. So there can be a float all boats. And, uh, and then, of course, there are ethics and uh, transparency, and we really need to understand how the AI algorithms were designed, uh, what they're intended to do, and what they actually are doing. We have to be able to get under the hood, just understand how their bias is built in. Uh, is there harm that's inside of this ultimately human designed algorithm that then takes on a life of its own? What was, what was that human input that ultimately led to the recommendations that were being made? So thank you and I'll be coming back again.